Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the TSC call. So, as you know, we all need to live by the antitrust policy, the notice of which is being displayed. If you're online, I think everybody is pretty much so. And we have the code of conduct that I'm sure you remember as well. Browsing through the list of participants, I only see very well known names. So I'm sure everybody's familiar with all that stuff, but I think we can call it done. So the announcement as the title implies is more of a reminder, two main items. We have the newsletter, everybody please do keep that in mind and uh, take it as an opportunity to, you know, reach out and publicize what's going on in your projects or group. It's an opportunity to socialize their work that we don't uh, take advantage of often enough. And then there's the membership pro mentorship program that's going on. So you have until March 11 to make a proposal. Is there any other announcements anybody wants to make? Hey Arno, this is Daniela. Um, sure. I just want to remind everyone, and we should just, and I apologize. Uh, we'll put it up in the announcements for next week that the Hyperledger Global Forum uh, CFP is now open and uh, is due to close March 12. So please do submit your talks, uh, have your teams and your colleagues submit. We'd love to see representation across all projects, working groups and special interest groups. Good point. And uh, are you still looking for uh, program committee members as well? Um, it's still open. We have a fantastic list. I think we're over 30 already volunteers. So uh, we're good there. Okay. But if anyone is dying to participate in the program committee, you know, to help select content and um, we would love to have them. So um, that's still open. And CFP, as I said, will be open through March 12th. Any questions, just let anybody know on staff and we're happy to coach you and help you. Very good. Thank you. So with that done, uh, we have no fewer than three quarterly reports. Indy actually um, submitted one, and as well as ARIES. You may remember that we had not had a report from the ARIES group or project for quite a while due to an oversight in the calendar. And they had uh, submitted an extensive report just a few weeks ago. I had I noticed they were on the calendar for report. I didn't expect them to submit one, but Stephen went ahead and it published one anyway, updating the previous one with highlight, which I quite you know I'm quite grateful for. And um, so, and then we had, we had a new report from Iroha. I didn't see anything that really needed to be brought for discussion to the TSC, but this is your chance to either highlight or ask anything or ask questions if you want. If not, I mean, we'll, I'll probably carry those over next week as well because some of them were just submitted a day or two ago. So I can imagine not everybody has had a chance to look at it. Right. And we'll look at the status. But yesterday, when I put the agenda together, I noticed there were quite a few names missing from the list of reviewers. So, and that's okay. Arun? Hey, I uh, just wanted to point out that there are two open questions in Iroha. Two open questions on what? Ah, yes, thank you. Um, I just commented out quickly uh, just before start of this meeting, but if, if answers need to be corrected, then feel free to correct them. So the, the, the uh, yeah, the, so the... So the first one, the answer is no, there isn't. And quite frankly, given how little the traffic is on the TSC list, I feel like if anybody wants to see anything about TSC, they should just subscribe to the TSC list. I don't think 
we have so much traffic that they would be inundated and not be able to post what's what they want. The due date, we also, we have responded to this in the decision we made. We are still trying to figure out how to properly implement the repo linter part, but uh, I don't have it up the top of my head, but I think it's next quarter, right? So we can point out to the decision, the record for the minutes. Thanks for bringing that up, Aaron. Anything else? I, I also suggest an answer to their first question is um, if they find the TSC list too high volume, which I wouldn't think of it as a high volume list compared to, to many others, um, mm -hmm. then recommending to them that they at least follow the, the agendas and, and meeting notes of the TSC calls um, might be might be of suitable length uh, rather than re, you know having somebody reformat that into a newsletter every time. My hope is that the notes can stand alone if somebody can't attend the calls. We I have to also, say, I'm puzzled by the term TSC solutions. I, I'm not sure what they meant, but I assume it's resolutions. Yeah, I would imagine. I, I will uh, point out that at the top of every meeting, right, we do have this. And the TSC members are, there's nothing preventing the TSC or a member thereof of putting an announcement here saying, this week the TSC decided on this. Um, provided it's developer centric. So this is a form, you know, two developers and four developers. Very good, uh, Ray. You're doing a good job at uh, pounding that one into our brains. Hart, do you have a question? Hop doesn't have his hand raised. Sorry, I was just, yeah, I just was reaching for the, the unmute button. Yeah, I just asked about the the Aries active status stuff in chat. I don't think it's it's ready. That's not my, that was my okay. reading that yeah, worked. Uh, right. no, no worries. I was just curious what the, the status was because they have a pretty uh, expansive document, I guess. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't see Steven here. I guess we, yeah, you're right. I guess they should. Uh, In the report, he says they expect to provide it to the TSC for consideration in the next few days. So I'm waiting for that. Okay, I guess we just wait for an email from Sam then? Yes. Or someone, okay. That's my interpretation of what was in that report. Uh, I think we did trigger their interest when we kind of pushed and say, hey, you know, I don't know why you're not trying. <laughs> you should go ahead and apply. And then uh, they took that to heart and they started working on their application. And that's what they are reporting about. But I don't think it's for us to jump on it quite yet. So stay tuned. Anything else? I think it Dino? I think it would be useful for when projects that aren't active report, if they're not active, they list like one or two reasons of what they're working on to get too active that they're not currently active. So that at least gives us a tracker of what, what they think they're missing. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. I think some groups might be a bit shy in this regard and wrongfully. <laughs> they should at least try and I think trying is a good exercise to try to figure out where you are, you stand, right? And I think that's what the Aries project, for instance, realized. You know, when we nudged them, they said, okay, let's have a look. Maybe we can actually get away with what we have. So, yeah, that's a good point. We could uh, suggest people have a, maybe we can, I mean, we could just, pass the word around and say, hey, maintainers of projects that are not, that are still incubation, we encourage you to make it, to have a closer look at what, where you stand in regard to your, um, the graduation to out of incubation. Troy? Troy? Yeah, uh, 
just to, from the chat channel, I think the request was to consider the document and um, what else has to be done in the document. Um, but that was how I read the chat message in the TSC channel. Uh, yeah, I see. <laughs> Is it? I've not seen that one yet. Ah, so maybe we can help them there. Uh, Brian, who do they go to for the legal checking on the trademark? Legal checking on the trademark. I, I, I'll, I'll, this first time I'm seeing that question, I'll, I'll talk with them about that. Uh, I'll, I'll take um, that. There, there's an email, a general email. It's called trademark at hyperledger.org. Yep. Um, that would be the best thing. It's monitored by um, our legal team and staff as well. OK. And what do we say about the alignment with the hyperledger architecture? Kind of feel like this is outdated. Unfortunately, we had this idea initially. We had the Hyperledger uh, Architecture Working Group. They set up a general framework, kind of a reference point for all the projects to be able to specify where they fit in. I don't know if it's still relevant or not. Well, maybe they could talk about their relationship with India and Ursa a little bit. Yeah, just I think this positioning with regard to the other projects essentially would be good enough, right? Let's just tell them that. If anybody else thinks they need to do more, you need to speak up. Okay. I'll, I'll, so I'll get a response on the trademark stuff ASAP. Um, All right, thank you. Anything else on this? I think we can just help them there. They're probably trying to close on the remaining uh, topics they have to submit the application and that's it. That's a good sign. They're probably close to being done. Okay, I don't see any other hands up. So I think we are done with this. And so back to what uh, Dana, Dana was saying about the, um, the questions for project in incubation. Dana, you're saying you would want us to put that explicitly as a question in the template for a quarterly report? Yeah, because that way we could see, um, put it in their mind that they should be moving off of incubation so they don't get too comfortable there put it in their mind that they can and should, so I might just forget. But I think most importantly, it gets them to reflect on what their um, what their current shortcoming is and try and focus on that. And if they don't, if they look through and do the inventory and realize, well, we think we have these, well, now that's a good indication that it's time to ask. Yeah, the, the, the only hesitation I have in making it in such a, you know, formal way is that basically you're asking them to, to answer all the questions. So, that you know how they uh, meet the leagues in criteria and which one they fail. We would form the question is you know what what area um, ask them to list one of them that they're working on that they don't think they currently meet might be one way to we need to get some formulation to say what's what are you working on to get to the incubation to get out of incubation what area are you currently working on we need to get some good formulation on All that. Right. Probably won't be ready for, for wording today on that. Yeah, so how about uh, if you can think of a proposal to make, is submitted to the TSC, could do that on the mailing list, say, hey, how about we add that kind of question? And then we can put that on the agenda. And, and, okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right, let's move on then.
We have quite a few discussion items. Quite frankly, it's okay if we don't finish. There's more that could have been put on the agenda. Um, and uh, I just, you know, picked a few that I thought was worth uh, discussing today and we'll go as far as we can in the list. So the first one I wanted to follow up on the standards work. So now we actually had two I mean, the, the question of how to do standards within Hyperledger kind of came in two different ways. The ARIES project brought it up when they made their report. And, um, you know, we had a fairly quick discussions about the fact that Hyperledger is not set up for, for standards work, but maybe there would be a way to do that. And um, I expressed, you know, the opinion that we should definitely try to figure out a way to allow this work to happen because ARIES is already doing it. And apparently some SIG working groups are also working in the standards uh, space. And so um, I brought it up to Brian who had not been on the call when we discussed this. And he came up with an answer saying, well, actually there is a mechanism we could use. He sent an email, which Rai is now displaying if you're on the, the if you're on the Zoom uh, client. Um, and so essentially the answer is yes, there's a way, but we will need to get approval to do that and define kind of the scope. And uh, at the end of the day, what we need is, uh, is a volunteer to push this issue forward. Brian, do you want to say more? Nope, I captured it well. I think you, your email was good. I have to thank you. <laughs> it was the right amount. I know I <laughs> complained to you about <laughs> writing too long email. This one was great. Thank you. So I'm off, you know, I'm opening it up to the rest of the TSC now. I mean, how do people feel about this? Do we have anybody from the ARIES project on? I don't see anybody. I'll be talking later today with uh, Stephen Curran, uh, so happy to pass along. Um, okay. Anything we say here in that in that call, but or any questions we have. But so you know, I, I, I see this pattern for for potentially other projects too. Um, yeah, and I think that's an important question: is you know, what is the scope, and so. Maybe you can, so I think we want to be a bit careful not to make it too broad a scope, but does this mean if we were to say, yes, the ARIES project, for instance, can do that, and then we decide to do it somewhere else, we would have to go through the same process again? I think that'd be the, the safest thing to do from a risk limiting yeah. point of view and, and from bringing people on board to, to that specifications process, that it's not just all things blockchain or all things identity. Um, I, you know, so so one one for Aries RFCs, one for uh, you know intra ledger RFCs. If we wanted to do um, something around just like Cactus, you know, as setting out some sort of specification um, proto standard, I still think the best thing is to to bump these things upstairs, so to speak, to other proper formal standards bodies if they are things we really really want lots of others to adopt, but. But and practically, I mean, this preps it for that kind of move. Okay. Practically speaking, is it kind of like a charter we have to put together? Yeah, I mean, there's a template that we'd be able to use um, uh, to. It basically is a becomes a sub charter of of um, the Hyperledger charter. Um, so this is something that the governing board would also need to approve. And if folks here are enthusiastic and, and there are people interested in helping manifest this, then I can um, mention this and seek governing board approval for going in this direction um, at our meeting on Tuesday, uh, if, yeah. if we'd like. So we can, we can move on this reasonably fast. And the community specification uh, GitHub repo that is linked there um, sets out a template for uh, the, how, how this works, basically. Um, you fork that repo and then follow its recommendations. And you, I know that, you know, I talked about pre-standards pre work, which made a few people smile uh, last time because the, the term standards is pretty loaded and, 
you know, sensitive to some people or organizations. I don't know that we want to say we are going to work on standards per se, but I would, you know, it, I, this talks about specification, which is exactly what I would have suggested to use as the term, just so that everybody is on the same page. It's essentially the same, the difference is really in the, in the uh, level of official <laughs> endorsement by some, you know, establish, uh, established uh, standards organization or not. So it's fairly common nowadays to have groups develop specifications that eventually can be submitted to a formal process at which point they can become standards per se. And even in the standard space, there are different levels and, you know, between de jure organization or not, so. But so I'd like to get a bit more feedback from the TSC. Is that worth, you know, uh, pursuing? Last time when I brought it up, you know, or, you know, when uh, the Aries project brought it up and I, I suggested we should look into doing this. People were fairly, you know, I had a good sense that people were supportive of doing this. So I was pleased to hear from Brian that we had a pretty much a ready to made uh, solution at our disposal. We just need to act on it. And so what I'd like to hear is if the TSC is happy pursuing this further, Um, not a suggestion, but I have a few questions around it. So, um, may, so I mean, if, if Hyperledger had to do it, then there were many other opportunities in, in past, right, where Hyperledger could have done that. So I wanted to understand what were the reasonings that, uh, or is there any thoughts which, where Hyperledger had to stay back, step aside on going with, going through this route? Or would there be any consequences of this in, in, with others? Uh, um, I'll speak personally, at least why why I've kind of steered us in that direction, which was uh, I had a I have had a notion that it's better to have standards done at organizations that are are orthogonal, um, and it probably was my my um, experiences with the IETF and Apache that you know this was it was really great to have the ietf as a place to bring together multiple different implementers uh to talk about the way this you know things should be and then at apache to bring together the builders to build the things the way that work <laughs> and have this kind of feedback loop between the two but able to push back in either direction if the spec is wrong you talk over here if the implementation is wrong you talk over there um, and I kind of think projects that say the code is the spec or that have too tight a tie between them um, don't do justice to that orthogonality. Um, it was also a way to be able to say, you know, we'd rather work with organizations out there that see themselves as standards orgs, whether W3C or, you know, Ethereum Enterprise Alliance or others and push things to them uh, uh, on the hope that they would return the favor. And if they're building code, push things to us, right? Um, and so uh, I think that might still be an answer to specifically the question from Aries, um, uh, as Hart mentioned, uh, was it Hart or Troy, sorry, thanks. Uh, the DIDCOM messaging work uh, is happening in, in DIFF and DIFF is set up as a um, uh, as part of this JDF thing. So, so is the open, open standard structure inside the LF. Uh, and it could be that an appropriate response, this is something I'll talk about with Stephen is um, that more of the ARI spec work happens over there. It probably happens under a different brand just to help keep things clear, you know, uh, that ARIES is about the implementation and you know, some other name is about the the specifications, but um, you know, so so just want to make sure we've thoroughly explored this option, and and even if Aries happens there, you know, prepping this for for the next calls out to to graduate, you know, a project level spec into something more general purpose, um, it'd be nice to have. Yeah, so I you know obviously I have a similar background as yours, so I have the same traditional view on the separation between specs and open source projects. At the same time you have to recognize that the boundary is getting more and more blurry by the day because you have organizations like Oasis started doing open source, even though there was a standards organization. You have Eclipse is doing the other way around. They, they were open source, but now they do some standards work. So 
I, you know, that alone at this point, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't stop me. I would say, yeah, we can do both. It doesn't matter. Nathan? Uh, I think um, the ability to, to do, so, especially some proto standards work is very helpful. Um, what we found when we started the ARIES project was that most of the standards bodies weren't ready for the kind of work that we had unless we could give them concrete examples. Um, and uh, the concrete examples, they didn't understand them in the form of just strictly a code base. Um, we had to have something that looked more like a specification that had some interoperability considerations. And uh, if we only had something that was referencing just the technical spec of our single singular code base, uh, it didn't really do enough. Um, to get the, the effort off the ground. Um, and so having some of this infrastructure in place for proto standards, I think it, even if it's just that, it helps a lot. Um, but at the same time, I, I wanna emphasize what both Brian and, and Arno have, have talked about, moving those into a, a, a more appropriate standards body when they're ready is also something that's helped us get things in front of more, um, more eyeballs. Um, and help build compatibility with other projects outside of Hyperledger. So um, it, it's kind of something we have to take on a case-by-case -case basis, but having these tools in our tool belt for when we need them is really important. Um, you know, the early process of trying to figure out where to incubate the, the standards that are being built with ARIES was really rather difficult in part because the DIFF has um, a bunch of code bases that they host and they have some overlap with Hyperledger's mission. So um, figuring that out took quite a bit of time. Um, and uh, everyone was really cooperative and collaborative in that process. And I think it's worked out pretty well. Um, but it, having some of these tools available to us would have helped us through that process. So uh, yeah, I'm hoping we can uh, get approvals so that we have some of these things ready for when something like this happens again. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, I, I was just going to say uh, what Nathan said. I think the, the issue is having a, a place for these pre-standards, proto-standards, whatever you call them, um, and, and also the potential difficulty when you're moving between two different communities. Um, when you're dealing with these pre-standards. So it's a bit of an echo of what Nathan was saying. Um, when we're talking about different communities, they have different um, leadership and different um, goals. Um, so it, it can be a little more difficult to um, start that kind of project somewhere else, uh, especially when we're talking about these pre-standards kind of activities. All right, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, if not, I think we can leave it at this. Oh, Arun, you're back on, please. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so yeah, I mean, a few more questions arise, right? With this, for example, if Hyperledger posts a specification or if Hyperledger moves towards standardizing, then a standard will be effective if we have multiple implementers interested in, in doing, uh, getting it through, right? Um, so who, who are those other parties who are going to use and, or is it just going to be within Hyperledger that we have different implementations available? So apart from those, the other questions which also arise, uh, which at least I could not uh, understand so far is, what will be the format? Like, how do we get it through reviews? How do we, um, what could be the structure? All those questions to arise. I, for me, it is still lacking so many questions, so I, I'm not able to, to comment on it. I mean, the structure, I think the idea is, well, we use the same tools. I mean, there is, they effectively have been doing that already, right? And they have multiple implementations within ARIES itself, and there are people outside Hyperledger implementing the spec. So I, this is, but it, you know, I agree with you that it's key for standards at least to be successful to have multiple implementations. And there are standards organizations like there with we see they have, they do require at least two independent implementations for the spec to become a standard. That's why I also don't want us to call it a standard 
we have to be careful what we call it. But I think if we call that a project spec or some community spec, like it was discussed before, we can, you know, get away with that, with that much, you know, as long as we don't pretend it's more than it is. <clears throat> so in terms of the structure, I mean, the important aspect is the legal aspect and, you know, um, which is addressed in Brian's email. You need different type of licensing commitment from people who participate in contributing to a spec than you do for open source. That's just the way it is. That's what the framework is meant to address. Okay, but so I haven't heard anybody saying don't do that. I understand people like Harun, you know, rightfully may have more questions, but I think it's worth pursuing. And so Brian, uh, you know, do bring it up to Stephen when you talk to him. And uh, okay. let's see if, you know, they are a volunteer. I think it's the kind of thing, if there's one project that goes through the process, uh, they all kind of, you know, figure out a way and then we become easier the next time around for us to work through it. Okay. And if Aries decides to pursue this path, um, I'll be coming back here and just looking for a volunteer or two to help work with with us you know, you know, and myself and and Ryan and, and others on the staff side to, to to implement this in a way that's that's fair and and transparent and and, and solid. All right. Thank you. All right. Moving on. Lab sponsor. <laughs> I had to bring that one up. So first, it kind of you know came into in part a, into the 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 feedback we received uh, from Tracy and our discussion with the SIG, and you know which had to do with the friction that some people have, have experienced working at, with the labs, and it seems like one particular point of friction is the 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 rec current requirement of finding a sponsor when there are actually quite a few people who are qualified to become a sponsor. Uh, among those, uh, few seem to be interested. Um, we talked about the challenge people have. I mean, we have seen, I mean, I'm a lab steward and uh, others are too. And, you know, I can see there are people come up with a proposal, they don't have a sponsor. And we say, you need to find a sponsor. And they're like, okay, where do I find? And we some proposals get stuck there just because they can't find a sponsor. And I have, a, I'll admit, I have volunteered myself many times just to, out of pity, because I'm like, it, this seems a worthwhile project. I'll just, yeah, put my name and let's move on because I want to give them a shot. And, and, and we've talked about this before and we said, okay, let's create a list of people who are volunteer to become sponsors. And that went nowhere. Nobody pretty much volunteered. So we don't really have a list to share with those people. So we haven't solved the problem at all. And yet, as I said, you know, in my email, when I look at what it takes to be a sponsor today, it's very little. It's basically you look at the proposal and you say, I mean, there are two ways, right? There are cases where I work with people, they come to me, they say, hey, I'm working on this. I could we bring it to Hyperledger and I say, oh, you can use a lab, you know, to do this. It's a good first step. And then I said, well, you can, you know, I've discussed the project and I'm like, yeah, you can even put my name as a sponsor and that's good. Or they come and they don't know, right? And then we have to tell them, well, try to find a sponsor. And I've been trying to not volunteer myself all the time. <laughs> But so that's the situation we're in. And, and essentially you just have to look at it and say, yeah, that's within scope of the hyperledger. And you know, the project seems well-defined enough and good to go, put my name on it. And the lab stewards do a very similar job as a steward, even if my name is not on there and I, there are other people here, you know, Tracy, Troy, Rye, we all contribute to this. We all look at those proposals and deep in as well. And we're like, hey, can you please clarify the description? What do you mean by this? And there is some dialogue going on and we help them shape up their proposal. So there is, you know, it, it works. 
And then we say, yeah, okay, looks good enough. And we approve it. And I'm like, the role of the sponsor versus the role of steward, as far as I'm concerned, I'm being both at times, makes no difference. So I'm like, let's just get rid of this sponsor, which, you know, we can fall into this mode where basically I volunteer every time and, <laughs> and I would do no more than what I do as a steward anyway. But then what's the point? So I know now in the email discussion, Brian, you know, set up a whole bunch of expectations from the sponsor, which we have not agreed to, which I'm not saying are not reasonable, but this is not the case today. And we talked about this before. We agreed not to expand on the role at the time. So that's where we are. I spoken enough. I'll I'll let you guys speak up. I'll, I'll okay. just toss in that. I think there is some misunderstanding that what was expected to be the bare minimum that sponsors would do somehow turned into the expectation of the ceiling that that's all that they would do. Um, so that that was the that was a semantic change I missed in the in the in the previous conversations because um, it was always about okay. helping scale out the, the lab so we could accept more projects without uh, creating us a, 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 a stressy burden for the stewards. So, hey, uh, um, I'm on my phone, so I'll raise my hand. If anybody else raised their hand, but who's Gary? All right, so Bobby is first and then we'll go to Gary. Sure. Yeah, thank you for the time. Um, I just recently experienced um, the lab process as volunteering to be a lab steward. And if you see the next point in our agenda item, um, I didn't have, or Ravi and I didn't have the guidance we needed to know what license to use. So we just used MIT. There was no real, he picked it. I didn't even notice it until it was brought up for the um, TSC call. So I'm just suggesting that um, the lab sponsors, it's a great way to, to get the, the projects going. And I would propose that the learning materials working group can you be used for um, people who have ideas, if we wanna promote that, that they could bring them to us and we'll help them with the sponsor pro uh, process to get into the labs like we did with Ravi. All right, thank you. Gary. So, you know, Arno, you brought up a couple interesting sort of points, right? And maybe, like, like again, I kind of, you, I think I have to go back in history, right? So if, if we go with the assumption that, you know, fundamentally people have something interesting, they think it's kind of related to hyper, to, 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 to the mission of Hyperledger or whatever you want to call it under the Hyperledger umbrella. They want to do an open source project. Like maybe we don't need, maybe the time to go acquire like sponsors, if you will, right? Or people want to help is like, if they want to bring it forward past the labs project. I mean, like you said, if there's a basic minimum set of criteria and people just want to have a, a community and a repository and a set that's doing that, I mean, we've really more expanded from where we were before, right? This is a lot different than, it's a lot different than how Hyperledger started. I say that every, probably on every call that I talk. So I kind of agree with you. I mean, maybe, maybe part of this is there's things that you might do, you know, as a lab, if you want to move forward, right, past being a lab or come out of that, which we already have. But maybe just to come in, if you were thinking of it more as, as long as it meets a, you know, basic set of criteria, I mean, to, to come over and just get started, maybe, maybe, there, maybe there isn't any more than, you know, you checking on it or whatever, a few people checking on it. So I kind of tend to agree with what you were saying. All right, thank you. Paul. Hey, yeah, um, this is a good discussion to have. Um, and I think that one of the important roles of the sponsors is not necessarily due diligence on the project, but just sort of community involvement. So I've seen, uh, well, there are two kinds of lab projects, really. There are lab projects by people that have done something else in Hyperledger, so they know all the rules, they know what to do. Um, you know, and this is really the simple case where, uh, you know, where, you know, do these people really need to go through the sponsorship process? The other case is where people who are totally, you know, outside Hyperledger, you know, come in and want to contribute something and want to start a lab. Uh, and in this case, right, you, you get people that sort of don't know how things work. You know, in Hyperledger, we have a lot of unwritten rules. 
uh, and a lot of sort of procedures that, you know, if you aren't familiar with the organization and you haven't been here for a while, you might not immediately pick up on and it might slow you down a lot. Uh, so in this case, you know, it it's, can be really nice for labs to have a sponsor because it's just sort of someone who can help them uh, sort of interact with the community, meet the rest of the community, you know, know who they need to talk to if there's an issue or if there's, you know, some uh, request for communication or, or just something like that. So sort of the sponsor is a, a community involvement person uh, rather than, you know, someone who's doing like due diligence on the project. Um, I, I think that's a really important thing. And I know, I mean, I'm sure Brian can tell you more about this and I'm sure I'm going to just completely butcher it. But Apache, it seems like uh, in their project lifecycle has some sort of like community champion role, I think it is, um, whose, whose job it is is to do stuff like that. And, and that seems to be a, a particularly impactful thing. All right, thank you, Hawk. So, I mean, practically speaking, we have different options available. We can revise the definition of the role of sponsor. We can keep it as is. We can get rid of sponsor. I think the question, you know, there, there are a couple of points that I don't think alone justify keeping a sponsor. So it seems pretty clear that we're missing some documentation about what's expected of the labs, such as, you know, you must use the Apache software license. You know, it's a failure somewhere in documentation that we have that expectation, but is the labs that's not being communicated to people who create labs. So that's an easy thing to fix and it shouldn't require having a sponsor to do that. Then there is the helping people get up to speed. I mean, I can't speak for the other stewards, but you know, being a lab steward, I'm happy to help. And we have a lab uh, RC channel. People can ask questions, and you know, I'm happy to to make it more explicit in you know in the lab documentation that you know if people have questions about how to get going about the community or whatever, they are welcome to contact the lab stewards. I don't need to be labeled as a sponsor to to do that. I would do it as a live steward, just not just as well. So Nathan. So one of the roles of the sponsor was to try to help build cross project collaboration and help us try to spread that culture of kind of working together as a broader hyperledger community. It sounds to me from what you're saying, I know that the, the lab um, coordinators are really playing that role already. Um, is there something more that we need to do in order to fulfill that purpose of a sponsor? Um, or do we feel like that, or do, do, do the maintainers of the lab's projects in general feel like that's a responsibility that they're willing to take on? So that's a very good point to bring up. It's true that we had this hope that the sponsor would role, would play that role. I don't know that they necessarily do. I think. Again, there are labs come in different ways. There are cases where, you know, they have been in contact with somebody like uh, there's a one that just, you know, I know um, that came up in the fabric land and uh, my colleague Dave, uh, you know, volunteered to be the sponsor because we had this call and they say, yeah, we're going to submit this lab. And they said, fine, I can be your sponsor. And there was a connection already happening. So from the get go, that connection is happening, it exists. I think there are cases where we have people from, and maybe that relates to what Hod was saying, you know, there are people who come from the outside world or they're not so well connected and they just bring up their stuff and say, hey, can I create a lab? And they are the ones who are going to struggle finding a sponsor. Um, I think indeed, if there is a connection, I know that, you know, when as a steward, again, when I review proposals, if I see something that relates to an existing project, I, I will bring it up and say, I, have you looked at this? I, are you in contact with this project? You know, and I would do expect that to you know, I, I, other stewards do the same. So, yeah, 
I, I again, I don't know that having explicitly a sponsor helps in this regard. And and again, the the lack of volunteers overall <laughs> in being sponsor, you know, I think is quite telling. So, hot, Nathan, you can lower your head. Hey, can I raise mine again or no? <laughs> yeah. You're like, yeah, you can. Yeah, so, so I think you have uh, done a good job of refining what we've been saying so far. Um, you know, what if we say something like, we get rid of sponsors in general, but if a labs project comes in that does not have any existing HL contributors on the team, uh, we ask that they find a mentor or something like that. And we have, you know, maybe the, the lab stewards or someone can help them find a mentor. Does that seem like a reasonable compromise here? No, you're not solving the problem at all because in the case where they have somebody, it's easy to put uh, to find a sponsor. They already have one. We are trying to address the case where they don't have one, right? Yeah, I guess you're right. Uh, Gary. So, the real question, or the, I think, if I if I'm if I'm listening correctly, isn't one of the so what problem are we actually trying to solve here? Seems that the problem we're trying to solve here is that there's a gate <laughs> that's gated. <laughs> by lack of participation of sponsors to projects becoming labs. And we had criteria for labs or whatever. And I guess I just go back to the original point that I was making before. Maybe that criteria has changed. Like maybe, I mean, maybe there has to be some basic stuff, right? That is related or whatever, right? I mean, is that, isn't that really the problem? There's more problems, of course, of them expanding and getting what they want out of it and all that, blah, blah, blah. But you can leave that up to them, right? Um, you, like you said, we have the help channel, we have the whatever. So if there's some basic criteria that it should be, I don't know, blockchain identity or whatever, something related to whatever we want to say our mission is, fundamentally, we're not enforcing that people have to work across stuff. That's an idealistic view, but it's not really what we're doing. So do we even need any of these gates other than, frankly, being you're willing to license your stuff under Apache and it should be related to one of our domains, like, you know, something related to the, you know, blockchain domain. That's exactly my point. I, I, I think this is an obstacle gate we have created that doesn't really serve any purpose. And of yeah. course I'm biased. You can hear me. I keep, I feel like I'm, you know, clearly pushing in one direction. I honestly want to be the one, you know, forcing this, but I have to do to, to say that. And I have felt that way from the beginning. And, and you know, uh, here we are. So, Arun. Um, You're the gatekeeper, so. so. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not related to what Gary brought up, but going back to earlier discussion just before uh, Gary, uh, if, if the question is about finding somebody, then we have means to, means to let people know that, um, hey, there are people who can review your proposal or it would be just a PR mechanism of getting that reviewed, right? I'm sorry, say that again, I missed it. Oh, so um, if, if the question is about finding somebody who, as a sponsor, then there are ways to let people know, hey, there are people who are willing to be your sponsors. All you do is just reach them out. That's, that's, it could but, be but sending Arun, This email. is what we've been trying for several years and it clearly doesn't work well. Right, maybe they are not pointed out on on this uh, proposal page. Where um, if if let's say we put a they mailing list, and... that that's indeed the case. They are not, and we said let's build a list we can point to, and nobody volunteered to be on that list. So on the one end, we are requiring people to find a sponsor. On the other, we have a problem because people don't want to be sponsors for whatever reason. They don't have time, they don't care. And so we basically are creating a, a wall. Either you're part of the community already, you know people who are going to volunteer to be a sponsor, or you're out of luck. Why don't we create a mailing list and let people send to that mailing list and 
somebody is interested, they they will get a response. Because the same people, because this is hard. Yeah. Because the same people, you can put people on a mailing list, but you still have to respond to it, right? I, I guess exactly. This is not the problem is not to communicate with them. They, if they ignore the mailing list or they don't volunteer to be on the list, you have the exact same problem. So I, I honestly, I appreciate the effort, but I don't think this goes to the core of the issue, which is we don't have enough people interested in volunteering to be sponsored. And maybe it has to do with the fact that there's a misunderstanding of what's involved and, and people say, well, I can't take on another project and be the sponsor and be there holding their hands and all that. I, I agree to your this point uh, because when it comes to hyperledger projects which which have been um, moved from labs out to the main repository under hyperledger the the meaning of sponsorship slightly changes to uh, saying that hey it's my organization which is going to support this project or it's it's that I'm committing to resources on contributing to projects yeah. but on lab side it is little different Yes, indeed. And I, I do want to point out that it's not a zero, uh, labs aren't a zero cost item. I know that the question is always, it's frequently like, what is the real cost? Like the, the real cost is uh, providing Git and GitHub support for people who are new to the GitHub lifestyle, um, you know, and, and a lot of handholding around like very white glove treatment for, for projects that are enthusiastic but are not quite sure on a technical level what they're doing. Um, so there is, you know, just opening the floodgates and saying, submit a PR, it, it gets auto merged, bring over your code base and go at it. Um, let's, I, I would say, please don't do that, but you're the TSC, so. No, but, but right, again, I mean, you see firsthand what happens at the lab. I mean, at the same time, do you think just because we remove the sponsor question from the template, all of a sudden we're gonna have an avalanche of, of proposals. That's just not the case. We're just going to, you know, let a couple more projects that have been, or proposals that have got stuck in without a sponsor and that's it. I, I think we, honestly, I think this whole sponsor thing came about from the beginning because of that fear that we were going to get floated with crap and, and project we couldn't handle. And I, I believe this is completely misled. Well, you know, uh, yeah, I, and I, 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 think, I, I think also, you know, we also thought we were gonna have a, we might've been wanting to be stricter on what we let in. Right, you, you know, all, all things kind of go back to when we weren't, I don't know. <laughs> there was a much narrower focus. The thing has broadened a lot more. Um, yeah, I, that's so. If, 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 if we're going with that broad spectrum, right, and then there's a way to move yourself to an official project, right, which is the main thing, then yeah, I get Rise's point on sort of some of the infrastructure or whatever, right? Um, but, uh, so, but we can't be the ones who teach everybody how to do everything in open source. Like, there's called, there's a thing called, I bet you know, some of you may have heard of, it's called the internet, and it, it's pretty helpful, I've heard. I mean, Al Gore created it, but it's, it's no, pretty but, useful. So I have a I have a concrete proposal. I mean, we could say, look, let's remove sponsor and check check back in say three months or six months and see what happens. Has that has that created a problem where now we have an avalanche of proposals and and that you know we can't handle? And if that's the case, maybe we put it back. We say, okay, that was a mistake. But I don't know. <laughs> we can blame me. But you know, let's give it a shot. I don't think this is a real problem, and I'm willing to take the chance. So I think I'm going to leave it at this. I'm going to make a formal proposal with a couple of actions which I think we need to take to, to address the documentation and the help issue and stuff. And and I'll put it forward to the TSC for discussion and maybe approval next week. Uh, before we close, we're out of time, but it sounded like the next item is a non-issue. Can we change that license in the HL starter kit from an MIT license to an Apache software license, Bobby? Yes, consider it done. Okay. And and as I said, you know, I think we need to document that so that, and maybe there are other things we should document and point to 
when people submit to the, that proposal so they have a better understanding of the expectation. I think I it's, a, you know. I put a space in the uh, chat room for the work to be collected. All right, thank you. Okay. So I'm going to leave it at this. I, the last one, I mean, the, or the next one was the good first issue. I realized after the call, we talked and didn't really take an action to, you know, agreed on what to do next. But we'll talk again about this next time. Uh, that's why it's back on the agenda. I wanted to say, okay, what do we do now? So with that being said, I'm going to close the call, although we have two minutes to spare, but does anybody else want to add anything to any of this? Or can we sure. close the call? I have something completely random. I spent some time uh, last week scrubbing over documentation of all of the maintainers for all of the projects. And I invited everyone that I could find to the maintainers email list. And I noticed that a bunch of projects have invalid maintainers in their maintainers files. They don't, the emails bounce or otherwise are invalid. So I just ask if you are a project uh, maintainer, take a look at your maintainers files and make sure that they actually reflect the state of your maintainership. Thank you. That's for current uh, or people who are listed as current maintainers, right? Because we also have sections of former maintainers that you mm -hmm. could expect that mailing the, the email to become invalid. When people I was, have change affiliation or whatnot. I was very careful, Arno. I appreciate your concern. It's a reasonable one. No, no, one. but I just confirm. I, I expected yeah. no nothing less from you, right? <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's all I got. No, no, it's all good. Thank you. So this is an interesting tidbit. So please uh, scrub your maintainers list. Oh, my file, I should say. All right. With that being said. I'm going to close the call. Thank you all for joining. I think we had a good discussion and uh, we're making progress.